Good morning, Wabash. Good morning, Josh. Today speaking at Pioneer Chapel is Dean of the College Scott Feller, Dr. John Roberts, and Nurse Chris Am Amadon with their talk titled The Coronavirus, What the Wabash Community Needs to Know. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dean Feller. Good morning, Wabash. Good morning, Dean Feller. Thank you all for coming out today and taking seriously your responsibilities as members of the Wabash community. What we want to do today is provide you with an update on our planning efforts related to the coronavirus, educate you on how you can contribute to the health and well-being of everyone at Wabash, and give you some ideas on what to expect uh, when you return from spring break. Oh, for those of you who just walked in, come find a seat. There are seats up front in the back. Uh, you know, we, 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 got, we, got room, we got room for everyone. Come find a seat. Come on in. All right. So uh, there we go. Get a seat up front. There we go. When you uh, received the message from President Hess, you uh, saw that uh, he described this as a mandatory chapel. He didn't mention that I would be calling roll. <laughs> I'm just going to begin with a couple of names, and uh, I'd ask this, this, these students to identify themselves. We'll see how long, far I have to go. Is Jordan Scott here? Yeah, okay, stand up, Jordan. All right. Jordan, thanks for showing up on your birthday. We're going to kick this off by singing happy birthday to Jordan. We're going to sing it Old Wabash style, which means we're going to sing it twice. We're going to sing it twice, all right? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jordan. Happy birthday to you. One more time. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jordan. Happy birthday to you. All right. That was a lot of fun, and we actually just learned something. That's about how long you should be washing your hands. <laughs> Sing happy birthday twice as you wash vigorously with soap and water is an excellent way to fight the coronavirus. Some of our public health, uh, global health fellows will provide us an alternative song later today. But that's the one I've been singing in Center Hall for the last 10 days. I've been singing happy birthday twice as I wash my hands with soap and water about once an hour. And those are the types of things you're going to learn about today. Those are the types of things that really can make a difference. Now, i got to tell you a little secret. Um, Jordan, uh, I'm glad we could sing happy birthday for you. This was, my plan was to sing happy birthday for my wife, Wendy, today, whose birthday it is, but who only walked in while we were singing for Jordan. So I had to call an audible. But I wanted to be correct. I, I was going to involve you all in a great plan to embarrass my spouse and teach you something. But uh, at the last minute, we ran through the colleague database and found a student whose birthday was today. <laughs> now, the chemistry teacher in me is uh, prepared to give a 50-minute lecture on how soap is such a powerful weapon against coronavirus, but I won't. We have much better experts here on the stage with me. Um, I'm going to keep it simple, though. 
The COVID-19 COVID is classified as what's called an enveloped virus. These are virus particles that wrap themselves in a protective layer of lipid molecules that they actually steal from our own cell membranes as part of their replication process. The, the virus particles use this oily coating to protect themselves as they're transported from one person to another, often indirectly through a surface. All you got to do to kill the virus is take the oily layer off. Soap is fantastic at taking oily layers off. It's that simple, gentlemen. The science is simple. Changing our behavior is the hard part, but it can be done. As I said, it's been a little crazy, but I've been in there singing happy birthday to myself. Sometimes I sing it quietly to myself if there's somebody else in the, in the bathroom. But we can change our behaviors. We can change our behaviors today. We can change our behaviors during spring break. We can change our behaviors when we return to this community in 10 days. And we can keep up these new habits. It's important that we do this. President Hess has drawn a number of people around campus to develop plans for how Wabash will respond to COVID-19 and how we are responding to COVID-19. Some of these have already been implemented. Uh, for example, our plan to synthesize the recommendations of public health organizations such as the Center for Disease Controls to make decisions about international travel over the spring break period associated with our immersion courses. I am deeply sorry that we had to disappoint Professor Nelson and his students whose trip to Italy has been uh, canceled. Um, I would love for this to be the only disruption of student learning that happens at Wabash College because of the virus outbreak, but at this point, I just don't think that that's what we can plan for. At present, our plans are to go forward with immersion trips to London and Ireland this week. Plans for dealing with coronavirus on our campus continue to be refined, building on procedures developed for the H1N1 influenza outbreak of about a decade ago. I'll share some elements of those plans at the conclusion of today's speakers. But a central element of all our plans, and an area that every expert organization agrees on, is that education is a central part of the efforts to stop the disease. That work, begi that work begins today, and that work will continue. Our community is facing a very real challenge, and I want to be very clear about one thing. It's your individual responsibility to listen carefully to our speakers today, as well as to practice excellent hygiene and do your part to help us ward off any potential outbreaks on our campus. I want to now introduce Dr. Roberts and Nurse Amadon, who will provide you with some of the additional tools to combat the coronavirus. Let me begin by saying our community is incredibly fortunate to have health professionals uh, of their expertise and their dedication to Wabash College. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. John Roberts. Okay, tough act to follow. Um, Hello, good morning, Wabash. I guess I have to do that. So a question I'm getting uh, 20 times a day now is, is this a big deal? Is it really a big deal? And my answer is possibly. Uh, we don't really know. I think the situation in China could have been a lot worse if they didn't uh, live under an authoritarian regime that could basically shut the country down overnight. Um, that's going to be tough to do in the United States. So I want to start with a sobering statistic, do a little math for you. We'll get rid of the chemistry with Dr. Feller. I'll do a little math. So our current population in the United States is about 330 million. So in a typical year with influenza, about 10% of the population gets affected. So if that were true for coronavirus, we'd be looking at about uh, 33 million people. The best we know right now, the case fatality rate, which is the percent of people that die from coronavirus, is about between 1 and 2%. But if I want to be conservative and say 1%, 
That's about 10 times as lethal as influenza that we deal with every year. So if just 1% of those uh, 33 million people uh, died from coronavirus, we could be potentially looking at 330,000 deaths in the United States. So that's kind of what we're looking at, probably worst case scenario, but why we're here and why we're concerned uh, about the whole Wabash community. And as you can probably see right now, all our hospitals are full with flu patients the regular beds, the ICU beds. So you can see if we start getting a bunch of coronavirus cases, we're gonna rapidly exceed the capacity to take care of people uh, correctly because a lot of these people need to be put on breathing machines and ventilators and things. So the virus is, uh, everybody wants to know, well, what, what do people die from with the virus? And it's basically pneumonia. That virus has a, what's called tropism. It's really uh, like uh, zeros right in on respiratory tissue, so your nose, your mouth, your throat, and particularly your lungs. So the people that die of coronavirus, typically their lungs fill up with fluid and infection, and, and really there's no treatment for it since it's a virus. Antibiotics don't do anything. So that's kind of the end game uh, for people that die from this virus. So just a little nitpicky thing, the virus is called SARS coronavirus 2. The disease caused by that virus is COVID-19. So you most often see COVID-19 uh, when you look at news reports and things. So it's very efficient. We've found that spreading person to person, you know, we think it probably came from a bat or another animal, jumped into humans, and we found out it's been a very efficient going from human to human. So our, a big concern we have is that it appears asymptomatic people, no fever, no cough, can spread that virus before they become symptomatic. So that's why, it's, as I go along here, it's important to practice prevention um, no matter who you're around. You don't have to be around somebody that's coughing or has a fever. So if we compare this virus to SARS, you guys probably don't remember it, you were, you were wee lads then. Uh, but back in 2003, it was a coronavirus and also MERS. Um, back in 2012, that came out of the Middle East. Both those were coronaviruses that caused respiratory symptoms. But in the short amount of time we've had, a quarter of the amount of time of those viruses, we've had 10 times the number of cases. So it's, it's extremely infective from person to person. Um, and we, we talk about r naught, which is kind of an epidemiologic term. Um, how many, what, what's the likelihood, how many people you're going to spread the virus to. So currently that's between two and three. So for each person that's infected with a virus, they have the potential to spread it to two to three other people. So any number over one means the, the infection is spreading throughout the population. So we want to get that down below one. So the spread of the virus depends on five things. These are the things you got to remember from, from today's talk, for me at least. So how much we encounter one another. How much we're out in public and uh, next to each other. So you want to stay away from people that look sick. If they're coughing, if they look feverish, you know, you know how those folks look. Stay at least six feet away from those folks. If we've got somebody that got disease, the disease, an effective thing is, is how good we are at quarantining those people and getting them away from uh, people who aren't sick. Like Dr. Feller mentioned, how often we wash our hands or use hand sanitizer is absolutely critical um, to slowing down the spread. He talked about the fatty envelope that gets destroyed by soaps or alcohol. Um, another thing is touching your face. You hear that a lot on the news. You know, I, I've, I've watched a couple of videos in the last week that, that kind of pans an audience like you, and they go through and they count how many times everybody touches their face. And on average, it's 20 times an hour. Um, so you really have to start thinking about not touching your face. Because right now, if the coronavirus is here and I just happen to rub my eye or whatever, boom, it goes right into your body. Another thing we have to, uh, important thing is the, the people that treat, people that get coronavirus have to be protected. So we're really concerned about healthcare personnel because if the people on the front line go down, basically all hell breaks loose. We got big trouble. So that's why we're trying to have people treating coronavirus patients. You know, we wear masks, we wear gowns, things like that. But you've hopefully heard on the news that you who are not infected don't need to be running around wearing masks. When you're in your travels next week, you're going to see a lot of people, I'm sure, wearing masks in airports. But it really does nothing for prevention. In fact, you're always adjusting your mask, and you're more likely to touch your face. So another critical thing is how healthy the person is to begin with when they get uh, 
in touch with coronavirus. So you'll hear that people that are dying from coronavirus are typically older people, people with other chronic medical conditions, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, other lung diseases, things like that. But we will see an occasional one-off person your age, somebody in their 20s, maybe a kid who dies of coronavirus. We're not sure why that is, but it does happen. I remember back during H1N1 about 10 years ago, we actually had a Wabash alum who lost his 15-year-old daughter um, to the virus. So it can happen. Um, so how healthy we are ahead of time is critical. So getting proper sleep, eating properly, um, just generally being in good, uh, the best physical health you can be in is important. And I'll touch on that again here in a minute. So the important thing to remember is all five of those factors are under our control. It doesn't mean we just have to lay down and let this virus uh, do its thing. So you can control all five of those things. So it's important for all of us, not only the Wabash community, but our entire population on the planet, if not the U.S., that we work together to act responsibly and uh, do our civic duty to keep that virus from spreading to people that will die if they catch it. So we have people in this community that have immune problems. They take medication that knock their immune systems down. We've got people with lung disease, diabetes. So despite you catching the virus, making a full recovery, you may incidentally spread it to someone who may not have uh, that good of an outcome. So 80% of people that get this virus do just fine. In fact, they may just have cold symptoms, may not have much of a fever or cough. Um, but again, those 80%, despite feeling well, they can get out in the community and spread it to people who are going to die. So the clinical course, typically we think incubation is about four days um, from the time you get exposed so you can spread it to others. Only about 44% of people actually have a fever, so it's, it's actually pretty low. And cough, only 68% of people have a cough. So those are the kind of the two screening questions that we like to ask people along with their travel history. Um, so it can be pretty nonspecific. So I would almost bet that the virus is in this community somewhere already. Um, until we start testing everybody, it's very difficult to know what's what. So concerns specific to Wabash, um, you know, we've got a lot of people living in close proximity, dormitories, fraternity houses, classrooms to some degree, depending on what size uh, the class is. So that's a perfect incubator to uh, spread that virus between each other. Spring break is kind of why we're here. That's a really uh, high risk time because um, you're going to have people you get in contact with at your destination. You don't know where they've been um, and you're going to potentially get infected and bring that back to campus. So I really want to hammer home, you know, you guys aren't going to cut this out completely, but when you drink a lot of alcohol and get intoxicated, you're going to forget your prevention practices. You're not going to wash your hands. You're not going to not touch your face. Um, it's going to make you much more likely to catch the virus because you just won't protect yourself. Just like we see the wonderful STIs uh, when guys come back from spring break, we're probably going to see some coronavirus. So... Alcohol, not so good this time of year. So if you go off campus and you are sick, you feel sick when you come, but you're coughing, you have a fever, we do not want you returning to this campus. Go directly home, recover at home before you show up on this campus. You want to be in an area where there's few people, um, where you're not going to come back here and uh, potentially spread it to those two or three other people and down the geometric or logarithmic progression. So I'll do a little, uh, everybody fired up for Top Gun coming out this spring? All right. So we'll do a little homage to Top Gun. We've got a lot of target-rich environments. Um, so in addition to living together, we've got social gatherings. Everybody's sitting next to each other now. So if we've got a case in here, not such a great idea to all be here now, but hopefully we're ahead of the curve. Um, parties. I think fraternities in particular, you really need to seriously consider having parties the rest of the semester. I know that's a bummer, but I mean, it, it has the potential to really bring people in here from larger campuses, Purdue, whatnot. 
Um, so really pay attention. You know, if you're going to have a party, definitely have uh, hand washing stations, alcohol sanitizer. Don't have people just super crowded together. Kind of screen people if they get, look like they're sick. Get them out of common areas. Um, so that we've talked kind of jokingly about National Act at our meeting the other day. So that may be on the, a discussion topic for another time. So trips to other campuses, uh, you guys do that a lot. You go to Purdue, you go to the places, go to the cactus. I mean, all this kind of thing is huge, uh, huge risk for you to bring that virus back. So how do we diagnose this thing? You know, we keep hearing about test kits. Um, everybody, there's a real, there's not been anybody on TV that's really described what a test kit is. Most people I talk to in the office think, well, I come in just like a strep test. You swab your throat and you find out if you have coronavirus. Not the case. You got to swab it, we got to send it to the State Board of Health. They've got to do a uh, RNA amplification test and determine if it's positive. So that takes 36 hours. So you're not going to find out when you come into a doctor's office if you're infected or a hospital or whatever. So we're, Indiana just got their kits this week. Um, so currently our testing guidance is really restricted. I mean, it's a specific set of symptoms, travel, things like that, of who we're going to test. As more tests become available, that's going to be uh, more common. Treatment, there is no treatment for this virus. There's no antivirals, there's no antibiotics. The only thing we can do is treat symptoms. If you get pneumonia, you can't breathe, your oxygen level goes in the toilet, you got to go on a ventilator and get extra oxygen. Some people have to go on a thing called ECMO, where they take your blood out of your body, put it through an external oxygenator, put it back in your body. Um, so this is why we're really uh, focusing on keeping this away from people that uh, potentially are going to get real sick. So this is also why we don't want to see sick people necessarily in offices, the student health center, ERs, things like that, because 80% of people are going to get better. So if you get sick, shelter in place, don't go out in public. Don't go to class, don't go to meetings, don't go to sporting events. Most people will get better on their own. If you get a lot worse, you're having trouble breathing, things like that I'll talk about, then is when you want to seek health care. So um, we, Dr. Dean Feller talked about some isolation. We're going to have some spots on campus where we can put people if we need to. So what we'll do as far as evaluating you in the student health center, the problem we got this time of year is we've got colds, we've got influenza, we've got other respiratory viruses, we've got coronavirus. They all look the same. We cannot tell what somebody has other than testing for influenza with a nasal swab, and that's an immediate response. So sometimes we could say, okay, you don't have the flu, but I don't know what the heck you do have. That's common in a lot of things in medicine. Um, so this time of year makes it very difficult for us. That'll get better as we get into spring and summer months. But, um, so the good news is they're all viral. All these illnesses are viral. You've got an immune system. It should be working for most people. You're going to kill the virus on your own without any medical treatment being needed. So what we'll say is uh, right now is if you feel sick, you're going to contact the Student Health Center um, either via email Nurse Amadon, or you're going to leave, call her or leave a message on the voicemail, and you're going to say, hey, I got a fever, I feel kind of sick, I'm coughing. If you feel like that, you're going to stay away from other people and wait till you get advice from Nurse Amadon. Usually we're going to say, okay, you're breathing okay, you're not too sick, stay where you are, we'll touch base with you every day or two, or call us if you get worse. We're not going to want you to come to the Student Health Center walk across campus, cough on Dean Feller, take him down, um, <laughs> things like that. So, you know, we, we get a lot of walk-in patients this time of year that just feel sick and just walk up to the clinic. We do not want you to do that. Contact us first before you come in. If, you, if you're super sick, I'll talk about some symptoms. We'll, we'll do some other things. But, um, you know, if you have a cough, you've got to presume we, we've got COVID-19 until uh, proven otherwise. So... So when you need to be seen emergently, so this is like uh, if you're breathing more than 30 times a minute, that's, that's bad respiratory stress, you, start, you could be developing pneumonia. If you can't walk around without feeling real faint, like, woo, I'm going to go down. If you uh, get real dehydrated, you're not urinating very often or your urine's real dark, I mean, anytime you get these sicknesses, you should be drinking water like crazy anyway. Or if you're not making sense, you notice a roommate or a fraternity brother or whatever is just, 
He is not looking right, not making sense. Those are the people that we want to seek medical attention. And again, we don't want you heading to the student health center if you're feeling like that. We want you to either go to the emergency room or call 911. So all this information I've uh, talked about, we've got a link at the top of the student health center webpage um, that takes you right to basically my talk outline here. And also, you know, guys do not read their emails on this campus. But I would say the rest of this semester, at least every couple days, you need to be looking at your emails, especially things coming from me or Nurse Amadon or anything that says COVID-19 information or whatever. You definitely want to read that kind of thing. Because um, we'll only send those out if there's important information or, or things that change. And also be very wary of social media. A lot of misinformation out there. Um, the best place to go, the, we've got the links on that, uh, on the web, the health center webpage. You know, cdc.gov is probably the best link out there um, that's updated at least two or three times a week. Um, so that's the best place to get good uh, information. So now I'll turn it over to our awesome nurse, Amadon. Right. Hello, Wabash. So I want to first of all give a shout out to the Theta Delts and Williams Hall who won the Wabash Always Fights the Flu competitions. So, so and just as we fought the flu this year, we're going to fight this and the same measures that help us fight the flu, help us prevent coronavirus, nausea and vomiting virus, they all have the same kind of prevention measures. So feel like we're hitting you over the head with that today? Yes, we are. Because we have to prevent this kind of illness because there is no treatment once you get it. So the people that got a flu shot, that's helpful. It won't keep you from getting coronavirus, but if you get the flu, you're more vulnerable to getting other viruses and other infections. So if you already had a flu shot, good for you. That was a good thing to do. And the reason that we hammer so hard on that every year is because you don't know when there is going to be a pandemic coming. So because we did a good job on our campus of getting a lot of people immunized against the flu, that's going to help us fight this as well. Um, and we, we rely on something that's called herd immunity, H-E-R-D, like cattle. If the whole herd is generally immune to an infection, then nobody else has as high a chance of getting it. And nobody has herd immunity to this virus because it's a new virus. So we count on herd immunity to protect vulnerable people, but none of us have it for this virus, so we have to use really good prevention measures. And one really smart thing to do is to just cover your cough. If, you're going, if you feel you're going to cough, don't cough into your hands. That's the worst thing you can do because everything after that that you touch is contaminated and that's how someone else gets the same illness that you have. So if you feel like you're going to cough and you don't have a tissue to cover up with, cough into your sleeve. That keeps the virus from shooting particles out into the air, although it appears the coronavirus is not necessarily as respiratory spread as much as with contact with surfaces, but covering your cough is really important. It's good courtesy. Washing your hands, everybody knows they've heard this, um, but we don't go through a lot of soap in the men's restrooms here is what the maintenance people tell us. So anecdotally, we know that's an issue. So let's work on that. Um, also think about cleaning surfaces that people share and touch in common. So things like doorknobs, your uh, computers that you use, clean your phone once in a while. Everybody has this disgusting germ-infested phone in their pocket. You touch so many things all day, you touch your phone, then you touch your face. Think about cleaning your phone with some alcohol wipes or this kind of things you use to clean glasses. Um, your phone is gross. Um, but help out campus services and thank them for what they do. They do a really important thing here on, sur on campus and we don't always appreciate it or express enough appreciation to them. So help them out with the cleaning measures and let them know that you do appreciate what they do. Um, try to avoid touching your mouth, your nose, your face, your eyes. We all do it so much. Everybody's trying to be more conscious of that right now. Um, and we know that washing with soap and water is the best thing. Don't run out and buy you know, liters and liters of Purell. Um, soap and water does a great job. It is good to have some hand sanitizer. If you're traveling or you're in a place where you can't get access to a sink, we know that at least 60% alcohol content seems to kill coronavirus. So look at your sanitizer that you might travel with. Um, 
Wash your hands every single time you cough, sneeze, blow your nose. I can't believe the number of people I've been swabbing for the flu, they blow their nose and then I'm like, there's the sink, dude. Go wash your hands, please. They, it's just, you have to wash your hands every single time you do that. Um, every time before you eat, that prevents all kinds of things. Um, every time you've been out in public, you know, if you go to Walmart, you go out somewhere, come home and wash your hands first thing. Um, and every time after you use the bathroom, every single time. Um, think about social distancing measures you can try, like um, we're violating that big time today, large gatherings, but if you are in a room where you can spread your desks out or your beds out, about six feet away is a good distance to keep from being within distance of somebody's cough. Um, it's a good time to stop shaking hands for now. During flu season, we kind of recommend Artie. people not shake hands anyway. Yeah, not to call out Artie, but yeah. So, but yeah. Even a fist bump, you know, has some germ potential, so let's think about not shaking hands for a little while. Um, if you're sick, really isolate yourself from others. You have to stay in your room. If you live within a distance, you can just drive home and be more comfortable and recover at home. That's ideal. And um, some other things you can do to help your immune system is get enough sleep. Um, that is something that I don't think a single person on this campus does, but if you sleep, you have better physical health and mental health. Um, your immune system really relies on that shutdown, that restart every night. So try to focus on getting enough sleep, especially while you're on break. Um, it should be a good chance to kind of rest and recover. So take advantage of that. Um, another thing you can do to not get sick is not smoking and not vaping. Um, they think part of the reason that the fatality rates for men in China may be so high is that they have higher rates of smoking. So it's an excellent time to stop smoking or vaping because what that does to your lungs makes you more susceptible to flu, COVID, and everything. Um, masks, Dr. Roberts mentioned, are not important. They're only for people who are infected. It doesn't help if you don't have the infection, you walk around wearing a mask, you're more likely to touch your face. Um, but do be smart if you're gonna be in an airport or in a crowded place next week about washing your hands, covering your cough, um, not touching a lot of things on the airplane, um, taking some wipes and wiping down that tray before you put your drink on it. The trays on the airplanes are the most contaminated item. So before you pull that tray down, wipe it, or I just hold my drink in my lap. I don't even touch those things. Um, some people asked at the faculty meeting earlier this week about a vaccine. It will be a long time before there's a vaccine for this. You know, it may be a year and a half or more. Um, when we get one, we'll be ready. With H1N1, our community did a really great job 10 years ago of immunizing people and having uh, lots of us volunteer to give shots for hours and hours and hours, and people waited in line for hours. Everybody wants a vaccine until you have one. But when, when the vaccine is available, we'll have a good mechanism for getting that out to people, but that will not help us for the next year. Um, and yeah, just be really smart about the decisions you make over spring break. We care so much about you guys. You guys are amazing people. You have so many talents, so many things going for you. And we want to keep everybody safe and healthy in every way. So we want you to take sunscreen on your break. We want you to not get too drunk or high that you can't make good decisions and protect yourself and other people. Um, there are condoms available in the health center. Anytime Allen Center is open, you can get condoms in there. Take some condoms on your break with you. Um, so. All right, so now our, our global health students are gonna help us do a little hand washing demonstration, a little interactive part of our presentation today. So GHI guys, come on up. Good morning, Wabash. From my observation uh, watching this whole thing, it seemed like sexual health, health and the mention of vaping raised the most buzz, uh, uh, which is an interesting thing and for another day, um, right? Um, you know, back in uh, a historical note, 1918, there was a really big influenza epidemic. And uh, one of the things that happened there was that little kids, it was found that little kids, you know, when they were skipping rope, you know, you know skip rope, right? And da dun da dun da da you know, you're doing songs like that. There was a song that was going around, and it was, I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened up the window, and in flew Enza. <laughs> now, you laugh, but part of the reason I'm saying that is because 
there's such a, it was such a humongous cultural thing that it worked its way into little kid songs. And so Dean Feller, like, totally, like, busted us here and, like, had that awesome thing about singing Happy Birthday and singing that song. And uh, one of your fellow classmates, I think, where's Nathan Gray? I'm calling you out, Nathan. Maybe you're not here. Nathan, I don't know where. <laughs> Nurse Amadon was saying, hey, we need to come up with something. Like, maybe, you know, let's be creative about trying to teach people hand washing. And uh, Nathan, I think, was one who made a suggestion about, hey, let's put it to something about with Old Wabash and ma maybe the first verse. And so I was kind of looking last night, spending way too much time looking at the song, looking at how much time, and thought, you know what? We can hook this up to the chorus of Old Wabash. So we hand out. So I'm going to demonstrate for you, in my observation, the hand-washing strategy for a lot of you. Not everybody, but here's what most of you do in terms of hand-washing. <laughs> okay? So that's one, right? Some of the more rigorous of you will go, like, turn on the water and then go, hmm, right? <laughs> right. So the 22nd thing minimum so the nice thing is about the chorus of Old Wabash, it's 30 seconds if sung in a relatively humane pace, right? <laughs> but we all need to understand, and here's the, here's the audience participation part of the, of the morning, right? And that is, is that a lot of you, you know, wash your hands and you do this, right? Put your hands together, wash, maybe do this, boom, you're done, right? You gotta be more, we gotta be more rigorous, okay? So. You got to do, so I want everybody to do this, right? There's a couple of things. Number one, the normal thing, you're going to put your palms together, you're going to rub those. The other thing that a lot of you, most of you probably don't do is, and this comes out of the World Health Organization, right? You, you put your hands, like, you're going to rub the back of your hand, right? Down into, between your fingers. And then guess what? You're going to switch. Whoop, right? Thank you. Yeah, you can make that sound, right? Then you're going to turn those hands back around and you're going to interlace your fingers. That's this next part. Then, I showed this to some guys this morning and they were like, gosh, this looks almost, like almost pornographic. But they're going to, right? You're then, I, I didn't get that, but, but <laughs> right? You're then going to interlock because what you're doing is you are washing the backs of your fingers on your palm. So you're going to do this and then you're going to switch, right? Are we good with this? We're almost done, so, right? Then that we're going to set to long in our hearts. Take your thumb and you're going to rotate. Some of you are not doing this. I don't know what your problem is. Let's go. You're going to switch. Right? And then under your fingernails, folks, under your fingernails, there's lots of critters. Tip to your fingers into your palm, which is going to be full of soap, right? Right? Palm, rub that clockwise, counterclockwise, switch, clockwise, counterclockwise, one more hand wringing, rinse, a lot of you, you know, one of the things you can do is you can use, you know, you know, these lots of great strategies, right? Try and turn stuff in and, you know, on and stuff like that with your arm, elbows, if you can. If you go into a public restroom and there's, there's a paper towel dispenser, one of the things that always, like, gets me is I wash my hands and then it's like, oh, crap, I got to touch the, I got to touch the dispenser to get the paper out. Like, maybe get the paper out first, right? Then wash your hands. Then it's free. Whoosh, you got that? Dry your hands. Use that thing to open up the door if you've got to do that. It's a public health thing. They ought to build doors that you can push open afterwards, right? Anyways, so here's the chorus, and we're going to practice. Ready? Dear old Wabash, thy loyal sons shall ever love thee. And for thy classic cause, the scarlet flag shall proudly flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long <laughs> in our hearts, hear the sweet Oops, oh, I lost it. Stay healthy.
Thank you to uh, Dr. Wetzel and his uh, Global Health Fellows Band. <laughs> I hope you learned a lot. I especially hope you learned that the coronavirus is real and you need to be prepared. I'm going to ask you to do some things before you leave for spring break as part of that preparation. Take, take time, tidy up your room, the common areas of your living room, living areas, secure your belongings. There is always a chance that you'll have to be moved out of your room and into another li living unit. Whether you are sick or whether you are healthy, depending on what could happen to your roommate. This is all for the betterment of the larger community. The fact is, you will need to be flexible. We will all need to be flexible. If we have an outbreak, most infected students will be sent home. For those unable to travel because of geography, we are setting up a quarantine space where you would sleep, study, and take your meals. I finally, I think, I want to also address that this is heavy stuff. This could be inducing some anxiety in you. It is inducing anxiety in me, all right? I wait, I, I'm waking up in the evenings, I'm thinking about these things. But you know what, I have methods to cope with this. It's not stopping me from coming and doing my work at Wabash College. If your anxiety over this issue or any other rises to the level that it's stopping you from doing your daily work of being a student, you should be seeing the counseling center. Give them a call, all right? That's good, uh, that's good advice all the time. As you leave today and over the next 10 days, I want you to think a lot about what it means to be a responsible citizen on and off campus. I want you to especially think about what it means to be a responsible citizen who is a member of a community. Now you may hear, or you may already be thinking that in being infected with the coronavirus is something you could handle. I appreciate that Dr. Roberts is telling it to us straight, okay? The, the fact is uh, that the coronavirus estimates, consensus estimates, seems to be it's, it is more deadly than seasonal influenza, um, you know, maybe in the 1% range. It's less deadly than historic uh, pandemic influenza, such as the influenza outbreak of 1918, also called the Spanish flu that Professor Wetzel just uh, mentioned. And it's, it's much less deadly than other viral epidemics, such as Ebola, which kills nearly 50% of victims. And you are young people, greatly reducing your risk of severe disease. But I want to go one, I want to hit on one other thing Dr. Roberts said. Um, while the mortality rate is, of course, an important consideration in judging the danger of any disease, another is the infectivity. How contagious is the disease? This is an evolving uh, uh, measure as far as coronavirus. Um, if you're interested, the New York Times ran a good article last week that looked at the kind of consensus estimates of the infectivity. Certainly, it spreads easier than influenza, the seasonal influenza virus. It especially seems to spread more easily in confined venues such as cruise ships and presumably student housing. Um, people with the seasonal flu infect on average 1.3 other individuals in the early stage of an outbreak. As Dr. Roberts mentioned, right now we think coronavirus patients infect on average between two and three other people. That sounds like a small difference, I realize. It is potentially huge. I could also give you a 50-minute lecture on disease transition dynamics, but I won't. Uh, most people don't know this. Early in my career, after I'd finished my PhD, I worked at the Food and Drug Administration, where epidemiological modeling was actually part of my portfolio. I take these calculations seriously, and I want to give you a very quick summary. If each person infects one other, the number of cases stays constant. If each person is on average infecting less than one person, the disease will die away. We know that in the flu, 
we don't even double the number of cases with each case. It's 1.3 people get sick from every patient right now. So the important number is the difference between 1 and 1 1.3 is about 0.3. Did you hear what Dr. Roberts said? The infectivity of the coronavirus could be 2 or 3. So instead of a difference from 1 of 0.3, we're looking at a difference of 1 or 1.3 or 2. This potentially could be a much more infective virus. My own experience working on these calculations and the experience so far in cruise ships suggests there are some relationships between high density and this infectivity. The growth could be dramatic. One of the things that people reminded me of, 10 years ago when we had H1N1, we went from three cases on campus to more than 40 cases in less than 72 hours. That's how fast things could change. What does this mean for your responsibility as a citizen? It means you have to think of others more than you're thinking about yourself. For most of you, contracting the virus will be uncomfortable and an inconvenience. The bigger problem is not your sickness, gentlemen. The bigger problem is that you could be infecting three other people when you get sick. You're not the only one who would be impacted if you became sick. Other students, your faculty, the staff, all of their families will be impacted. And in that group, there will be older individuals in that group, less able to fight the infection. There will be immunocompromised individuals in that group, unable to fight the infection. It's your responsibility to do everything in your powers to stay healthy because it's not your health you need to be work worrying about. It's the health of this entire community. This is the difference between an individual health perspective, which many of us practice in our daily lives, and a public health perspective, which is how we need to be thinking, especially in a time like this. You wash your hands to keep yourself safe and to keep your community safe. We're all relying on each other to take the good advice you've received here today and use it. I thank you in advance for taking your seriously your, responsible, your responsibility as a citizen, both on and off campus. Thank you.